Well, guess what? I'm aware that it's been out for days, but guess where I've been for the last couple of weeks? China! I was celebrating Lunar New Year with Dorothy's family, meeting members of the family I've never met, and while I thought I could work there, apparently I couldn't. A combination of having an absolutely packed schedule and, you know, censorship laws made it so uploading virtually anything was impossible. So, while I had access to the leaks, when I usually have access to the leaks, which was about a week ago, my computer didn't work. So, I couldn't upload anything. But now, I'm in Madrid, and I brought all of the recording technology I would need to make a video because I need to make a couple of videos while I'm on vacation because I got lazy prior to vacation. So currently I have my camera sitting on top of a trash can, a light clipped to my laptop, and as you can see, I'm using a lav mic. But Spain has no laws about what you can and cannot access on the internet, so we're doing the video now. So I'm sorry if this is the third or fourth video that you're seeing covering Boruto Chapter 7, but I'm doing my best here. This is what I do for you animals. But now that we got all that information out of the way, let's get cracking into chapter seven of Boruto, which was an absolutely packed chapter. But is genuinely anybody surprised Kishimoto hasn't missed in what feels like years and therefore an absolutely packed chapter is kind of the status quo nowadays. This chapter gave us the totality of the fight between Boruto and Mitsuki, a possible route for Mitsuki to join Boruto's side and forsake Kawaki, and some information about Omnipotence that even I didn't see coming, revealing to us that there's a possibility that Shikamaru has become privy to the details of Omnipotence long before this chapter, or even the chapters before this, and that Omnipotence as an ability cannot be reversed without Kawaki's will. And therefore, even with Shikamaru being able to break down what Omnipotence is and how it works, eventually, because of the strength of Omnipotence, that information will slip away from his mind. And while to many this chapter seemed relatively straightforward, as 30 out of the 40 pages were a battle between Mitsuki and Boruto, it was anything but straightforward. The groundwork laid in this chapter could pay off to some massive plot changes down the line. So today, we're gonna to be covering everything that happened in this chapter and everything that could happen because of this chapter. Because today, we're talking chapter seven of Boruto to Blue Vortex Explained. But before we get to explaining anything, guys, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. And genuinely, I deserve it this video. I mean, look at my setup. I'm in a hundred square foot hotel in Madrid. And if you guys really want to support the work that I'm doing, go ahead and follow my other channel, The Weeb Commander, where instead of talking about Naruto and Boruto, I talk all other anime and manga. And if you like the idea of hearing me talk about anime and manga, go ahead and follow my anime podcast, Utaku's Anonymous, where me and Daddy Mata break down everything that happened in anime this week. It's available on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. We're currently in the midst of a four week interview rotation that includes Frankly Built, Stephen He, Chris Barnett, and Stella Chu. Or if you guys just want to look like you keep up with all things anime and manga, go ahead and meander into my merch store, TakuZanonymous.net, where you can pick up some of the greatest anime t-shirts, sweatshirts, and sticker packs known to man. Yeah, that's right, baby, I haven't forgotten the plugs in the weeks I've been off work. So, Chapter 7 of Boruto probably what many will call the least eventful chapter in Two Blue Vortex. There was no massive reveal in this chapter, no crazy plot twist, just a great battle between Mitsuki and Boruto, the payoff of a little information about omnipotence, and ending the chapter with Hidari and Jigen Shinju, whose name I'm forgetting. But even the final page showing us what the Shinju was up to wasn't much of a reveal. Jura is his name. And sure, we end the chapter with Jura saying, okay, these books aren't teaching me enough, let's go pay a visit to Naruto Uzumaki, but we kind of knew they were going to do that already. But earlier in the video, I said that this chapter was going to end up being one of the more impactful chapters in Two Blue Vortex yet. So if there was no surprise twist, if the ending wasn't all that crazy, and the majority of the chapter was just a fight, where's that impact coming from? Well, in order to answer that question, we gotta cover what happened in this chapter. So let's start this video off like we tend to start these kinds of videos off at the beginning. The chapter opens up focused on Mitsuki, which to me is incredibly reassuring because it's looking like in Two Blue Vortex we're going to be getting a heavier focus on Mitsuki than we did in OG Boruto. See, Mitsuki in the story, after the introduction of Kawaki, had kind of become a lost character, which is a genuine shame because I believe Mitsuki is one of the more compelling storylines in Boruto. And this chapter truly showed us that we're getting back into that storyline and bringing it back to the forefront of importance. And therefore, this chapter opening with Mitsuki saying that 
that he's the moon. And because he's the moon, he has no light to shine of his own, that he needs his son, which he currently believes is Kawaki. We knew this already. However, while Mitsuki is doing his spiel about how Kawaki gives him the light to exist, we see Kawaki, who looks at Mitsuki with dismay, which possibly could be a physical representation of how Mitsuki understands that Kawaki doesn't like him and therefore can't necessarily be his son. And after Mitsuki does his whole talk about how Kawaki is his son, we flash back to the battle between Boruto and Mitsuki, where Mitsuki has activated his snake sage mode and is rushing Boruto. Now Boruto, continuing with the general vibe that he entered this battle with in part six, which is genuinely unworried, tosses a couple of kunai at Mitsuki, which Mitsuki deflects. And we see one of the kunai, or maybe they were ninja stars, that Mitsuki deflects sinks into a tree behind Mitsuki, which seems like a slightly odd thing to focus on, but it pays off in a second. Now Mitsuki he launches a barrage of snake attacks at Boruto, which he dodges with incredible ease, taking no effort to either activate his karma or his jogon, which we pretty much know that he can use by now. At least, maybe, because cosmetically, there's no differences between the Boruto we're seeing currently and the Boruto we saw in Chapter 1 in the battle against Kawaki. But then again, that battle between them will probably be closer to the end of the manga, and there might be an instance between then and now where Boruto activates his Jogon for the first time. Regardless, the take-home message here is that Boruto is not trying. But Mitsuki? is. The snakes that he's releasing with his snake sage mode are comparable in size to the snake that Orochimaru used in the Konoha Crush Arc. You know, the three-headed snake that he summoned in the middle of Konoha that was able to wipe out entire neighborhoods? Which implies to me that very casually, Mitsuki is at least at Orochimaru in the Konoha Crush Arc's level of power. But considering the fact that Mitsuki is a clone of Orochimaru and has access to perfect sage mode, which Orochimaru doesn't, he's probably far beyond that. Now, Mitsuki does manage to press Boruto to the point where Boruto needs to pull kind of an emergency move, which is using Flying Raijin to jump to the ninja star that Mitsuki deflected earlier, which, which he does with like incredible ease, which once again brings me back to the question, why did Boruto say he wasn't as talented in Flying Raijin as his grandfather? Maybe he isn't able to string together Flying Raijin jumps over and over and over again, but he's also used Flying Raijin in a way that Minato literally never did, and that was across dimensions. I genuinely see no good argument for saying that Boruto was worse at Flying Raijin than Minato was. Now, after jumping to his ninja star, Boruto asks Mitsuki, where's Kawaki? Because he believed that Kawaki would be the person after him, not Mitsuki. At which point, Shikamaru, who's listening in on the conversation, tells Boruto that Kawaki's out cold because of Mitsuki. And it's at this point that Mitsuki says something very interesting. Mitsuki tells Boruto that he believes he's beginning to get a perception of just how powerful Boruto has become, saying that if Boruto's power levels are now great enough to make code retreat, that Kawaki stands no chance against Boruto, which is interesting because it's telling. See, here's the thing. We really haven't seen any feats from Kawaki in Two Blue Vortex yet. In fact, the only two feats that we really have from Kawaki are both instances where he gets jumped. In both the first couple of chapters, when all of the Claw Grimes invade Konoha and Kawaki and Sarada and the rest of the new Konoha 11 are battling against the Claw Grimes, and when Mitsuki takes out Kawaki because he doesn't want him going after Boruto, Kawaki gets jumped from behind, inherently something that should never happen to a shinobi, which leads us to believe that both Mitsuki and and the superior claw grime that was able to hold Kawaki down might be more powerful than Kawaki. Which is odd, because the power that Kawaki showed in part one of Boruto was on par with limited Ko, and thus to assume that Kawaki's power hasn't really gotten any higher than that is kind of crazy. But it also might make sense. See, Kawaki has a complete and total aversion to becoming a shinobi. And somewhat ironically, this is one of the points that the anime better encapsulates than the manga, as there's anime-only arcs about Kawaki trying to become a genin and how much he hates going on genin missions. And thus, Kawaki is kind of a terrible teammate. But that doesn't mean he's strictly opposed to learning shinobi techniques. In fact, one of the biggest plot points in part one of Boruto is him learning shinobi techniques, which is why he's able to fool Ishiki with his shadow club. But really, the only reason that Kawaki was ever willing to learn shinobi techniques was Naruto. And now that Kawaki has Naruto sealed away in the Daikoku Ten, there's really nobody pushing him to be a shinobi. And since by the end of part one of Boruto, we had seen that Kawaki had awoken all eight of the spokes in his Dharma wheel, that showed us in part one of Boruto that Kawaki had already unlocked all of the abilities of Ishiki, and possibly more abilities than Ishiki ever had access to because he was able to lock away Naruto and Hinata in the Daikoku Ten, something that even Jigen slash Ishiki couldn't do. So with this simple exchange between 
between Mitsuki and Boruto is trying to tell us is that Kawaki's power has stagnated. While Boruto was training with Sasuke and Kashin Koji, two legendary shinobi, Kawaki was probably doing nothing. And thus, while Boruto, while focusing on the techniques of the shinobi, got stronger, Kawaki didn't. And this right here is why I'm saying that this chapter might actually have more impact in the later chapters of Two Blue Vortex than any chapter previous, because this chapter might introduce the true underlying theme of Boruto. See, the underlying theme of Boruto has always been somewhat similar to that of Naruto, that hard work will always overcome talent and technology. The technology aspect is really more focused on Boruto than it was in Naruto. And while Boruto being a genius, unfortunately, Unfortunately, strays us from that theme a little bit, it introduces a new theme, a difference from Naruto. And that theme is about the willingness to learn from the past. See, Kawaki's power is stagnated because he's only willing to use what was given to him and what he knows, the karma marking. But because Boruto is open to the usage of the karma marking and the shinobi techniques he's learned from Konoha, Sasuke, and Kashin Koji, he's more well-rounded and therefore much more powerful than Ko or Kawaki. And therefore, since Boruto isn't about a scrappy kid who outworks everybody, but instead about a genius who's able to pick things up with relative ease, the route that Boruto is going isn't about hard work, but the willingness to learn. And I believe that will be the major point of differentiation between Kawaki and Boruto in the future that leads to Kawaki's demise. But enough about that. Back to the battle between Mitsuki and Boruto. So Mitsuki is telling Boruto about how he believes that Kawaki stands no chance against Boruto in a fight. And Boruto says, if you don't believe Kawaki stands a chance in a fight against me, then you certainly don't either. Which could possibly be used as a way to confirm that Boruto believes that Mitsuki is weaker than Kawaki, but there's really no way for Boruto to know that. Now, to this point that Kawaki's says something rather cryptic. Mitsuki says to Boruto that the reason that he wanted to battle against Boruto without Kawaki present is so that he could go all out without deferring to Kawaki. Now, Boruto was kind of perplexed by what Mitsuki means here, and I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't perplexed as well. But what I think that Mitsuki is getting at here is subconsciously admitting that he's having trouble believing that Kawaki is his son, as Mitsuki doesn't want to defer to the will of Kawaki because he has suspicions that Kawaki may not be his son, and therefore giving into the will of Kawaki and allowing Kawaki to battle against Boruto when Mitsuki could be the one to do it doesn't feel right to him. Now, it's at this point that Mitsuki decides to go all out, summoning a ton of snake clones who attack Boruto in mass. And it's at this point that Boruto establishes that he truly is not his father when he tells Mitsuki that more is not necessarily better. Words that Naruto most definitely did not live by, but also could come from the fact that Boruto can only summon four shadow clones. Could definitely be an inferiority complex rearing its ugly head. It's at this point, after dodging a couple of the snake clones, that Boruto says, I don't have time to play around, and he pulls out Sasuke's katana, which he applies lightning release to. Now, technically, when lightning release is applied to Sasuke's sword, it's usually a variation of Chidori. But since Boruto doesn't have a Sharingan, we can assume that most likely, when this all gets animated, that that lightning will be purple. Specifically, it will be purple lightning. As it was revealed in Chapter 6 that Boruto could use purple lightning, and it was actually revealed long before Chapter 6 that Boruto could use purple lightning, because in the most recent data book, Boruto was said to be able to use purple lightning. Only 10,000 people told me that. You make one video being like, oh, where did Boruto learn purple lightning? Is Kakashi a rogue ninja? Did Kashin Koji learn it? And everybody's like, hey, Nick, you're an idiot. Or I didn't memorize Boruto's ninjutsu data book entry. It'll never happen again. I have to be careful yelling. This is not a condenser mic. Feels important to note that I'm also actively healing from a calf tattoo. Pody, blur out my feet. And yeah, I'm not wearing pants, I'm in a hotel. What are you gonna do about it? Anyway, Boruto treats Mitsuki's snake clones like Sasuke treated Naruto's shadow clones and electrifies them all to death. And with like, incredible ease. At which point, Mitsuki gets very frustrated and decides to use snake lightning to try and kill Boruto. To which Boruto nullifies with his own lightning release, Thunderbolt, which he's used for a long time, but which is now apparently on par with things like Chidori Sharp Spear. After nullifying Mitsuki's snake lightning, Boruto closes the gap between them and puts his sword to Mitsuki's neck. At which point, Mitsuki does his best emo kid impression and tells Boruto, end it all. At which point, Boruto sees through the tough guy act, telling Mitsuki that while he believes he came here prepared to die, it's actually that he's lost hope in who he believed in most, which would be none other than Kawaki, Mitsuki's supposed son. Boruto says to Mitsuki that Mitsuki must feel as though at one point his son lost its radiance. And Mitsuki responds to this by saying that Boruto is a grudge-bearing traitor who knows nothing about it. But Boruto retorts and says, I do know you. 
In fact, I know the location of your son. That's because I'm it. At which point Mitsuki becomes infuriated and wraps Boruto in a snake, but Boruto doesn't budge. And instead Boruto asks Mitsuki, why hasn't the snake killed me yet? To which Mitsuki retorts and says, why haven't you escaped from it yet? As both of them begin to realize that hurting them was not each other's intention. Boruto then tells Mitsuki, I'm sure you've realized it, that Mitsuki isn't your son. Telling Mitsuki that no matter how close he seems to stick to Kawaki, Kawaki refuses to illuminate him. And that Boruto understands that this kind of thing can be confusing. But Mitsuki knows ultimately that he's the only person who gets to choose who or what his son is. And it's at this point that what Boruto was saying seems to truly get to Mitsuki. As Mitsuki releases Boruto and asks him who the hell he is. And Boruto reassures him, don't worry, I have no intention of killing or hurting Kawaki. And he tells tells Mitsuki that the quarrel between him and Kawaki is simply a feud between two brothers, something that Mitsuki doesn't have to worry about. And all of this is exactly what I predicted would go down. One of the most prominent theories that we had going into chapter seven is that Boruto would most likely defeat Kawaki in a fight, but refuse to kill him. Am I mixing up Kawaki and Mitsuki? I feel like I am. Anyways, you know who I'm talking about. We're talking about Mitsuki. Really hard to delete clips with this setup because I have to click the button on the camera to record every single time and we're like, 200 clips into this video. Anyways, we hypothesized that Boruto, after defeating Mitsuki and refusing to kill him, would unlock in Mitsuki's brain that Boruto is his son. And thus this realization would either shake the foundation of what Mitsuki believed or fully sway Mitsuki to Boruto's side. And while it does appear to be the former, the latter is still definitely a possibility. Which is kind of crazy because in just the first seven chapters of Two Blue Vortex, Boruto has already pretty much got all the most important people at least questioning what's going on upstairs. Sarada Sumire, Amado, Shikamaru, Ino, and Mitsuki are all wondering why their memories aren't matching up with their feelings. But that may not be all that important. And that's what the end of this chapter is about. Timitsuki, after having a reality breaking moment, asks Boruto why he killed Lord Seventh. To which Boruto replies saying, he didn't kill Lord Seventh, that Naruto is still alive, and so is his wife. Now, this is a big shock for Mitsuki, but an even bigger shock for Shikamaru and Ino who are listening in. After telling these three that Boruto and Hinata are still alive, Boruto says something rather interesting, and something that I believe has actually flipped a new page in the story of what Mitsuki's character arc is going to be, something that I actually didn't see coming. See, Boruto tells Mitsuki that he believes that he is completely capable of shining on his own, but if he insists on having a son, that he can find him whenever and wherever he wants to. And character arc wise, this actually isn't something that I saw coming from Mitsuki, but I do believe this is my Sashi Kishimoto showing his hand because Kishimoto doesn't do anything for nothing. See, this is genuinely the first time that the concept that Mitsuki could shine on his own has ever been introduced. And I find it very interesting because yes, Mitsuki could shine on his own and that would actually be a fantastic character arc for him. The realization that you're able to be strong on your own isn't a new character arc for people in Naruto. In fact, one of the most important people to ever have a character arc like that was Sakura, who realized that Naruto and Sasuke were getting incredibly powerful through their own means and therefore she had to get strong through her own means. And thus, because of this, she was able to acquire strength that was non-reliant on Naruto or Sasuke, who ironically follow the sun and moon symbology. And the sun and moon symbology is one of the most common symbological themes all throughout Boruto. We have Sarada's sun, Ada's moon, Mitsuki's moon, Boruto's sun, Kawaki's sun. But to see Mitsuki break out of this and become a moon that's able to shine on its own would be very interesting for a couple of reasons. Mostly because if we're talking symbolically, this could possibly finalize the connection between him and Toneri, a character who came from the moon who simply wanted the ideologies of the moon to shine down to the earth. And thus if Mitsuki is able to find a personality and desires that aren't dependent on either Boruto and Kawaki, it would one, be a fantastic character arc for him, and two, symbolically tie him to the ideologies of the moon. But at the very least right now, Mitsuki's ideologies have been shaken. He's not sure if Kawaki is his son. And thus, we can assume pretty concretely that Mitsuki's not going to be going after Boruto anytime soon. Now, after hearing this massive reveal that Boruto and Hinata are still alive, Shikamaru tells Boruto to get alone because he wants to talk to him. At which point, he gives Boruto a rundown of omnipotence so far as he understands, saying to Boruto that omnipotence has rewritten everybody's memories to reflect Kawaki's desires. And it's at this point that Boruto drops a relatively huge bomb on Shikamaru and 
us, one that I'm not quite sure how it will pan out into the future. See, Boruto established Shikamaru that there's really no reason for Shikamaru to try and figure out how omnipotence works. As in due time, Shikamaru will forget how omnipotence works because that's how omnipotence works. Boruto reveals to Shikamaru that the very concept of omnipotence won't stick in his brain, and that even if you understand how omnipotence works, the concept of it will fade away from your memory in time. Boruto then tells Shikamaru that this is by far and away not the first time that Shikamaru has been told about omnipotence, as both Sumire and Sarada have told him about it multiple times, which is most likely true. There's been three years of Sarada and Sumire being the only people unaffected by the massive brainwashing that's gone worldwide. And even in chapter one of Two Blue Vortex, Sarada is telling Shikamaru about how Boruto was innocent. But what I find somewhat curious about this is the fact that Shikamaru really had no reason to believe that Sarada and Sumire were right. See, listen, if Boruto says if you learn how omnipotence works, it's going to fade out of your brain, then that's how it works. But something about Boruto using the example of Sarada and Sumire telling Shikamaru multiple times how omnipotence works just doesn't work for me, because ideologically, Shikamaru has no real reason to believe Sarada and Sumire. But the confusion doesn't necessarily stop there, because after Boruto tells Shikamaru that there's no real reason that he needs to remember how omnipotence works, he tells Shikamaru that he's simply just gonna have to believe that Boruto and Kawaki switched places without any proof. Which brings up a rather interesting point, that Shikamaru will remember that Boruto and Kawaki have switched places but not why. I mean that the only thing that you will be forced to remember is the fact that omnipotence is why you don't remember why things are weird. Which to me feels somewhat worthless. Like if you told me that my memories are going to tell me that bananas are poisonous, but that they're not actually poisonous, but I won't remember why I think this, that's not awful. I mean, Shikamaru was willing to communicate and reach out to Boruto and even ally himself with Boruto before he understood omnipotence. So him losing all memory of omnipotence in a couple of weeks isn't really the end of the world, and it doesn't really change anything plot-wise. But it does present an interesting logistical issue, and that is that it appears as though the only way to undo omnipotence is through Kawaki, is at least what Shikamaru and Boruto appear to come to the conclusion of. And Boruto brings up some pretty interesting points when coming to this conclusion. Some points that might dismantle the theories we have about Sarada's MS abilities. What do I mean? Well, Boruto brings up the point that Kawaki sealed away Naruto to protect it. So Boruto says that there's no real reason to undo omnipotence until they're able to convince Kawaki to do it, because if they undo it, Kawaki will just use omnipotence again. Now, this point is interesting for a couple of reasons, because depending on whether or not you take Boruto at his word here, it could either open the door to us being correct about Sarada's MS abilities or shut it forever. See, if you believe that Boruto is uninformed in the opinion that Kawaki could use omnipotence again, then there's genuinely no reason for us to believe that our theory that Sarada's MS abilities will allow her to break people out of Ada's omnipotence genjutsu would be incorrect, because if Kawaki doesn't have the ability to use omnipotence, potence again, and we'll go into why that may be a possibility in a second. And Sarada having golden Amaterasu flames that are able to pacify the hatred in somebody's heart and heal them. And again, Jutsu ability that warps the worldview of the person casted under it to Sarada's worldview are still perfectly valid and very powerful abilities that would make Sarada an incredibly important character moving forward. Why is Boruto believing that Kwaki is able to use omnipotence again in the future? possibly misguided. Well, that would be because of Kawaki and Ada's relationship. See, the first time that Kawaki uses omnipotence is in a moment of high stress for both Ada and Kawaki. However, we know that Ada feels an immense amount of guilt for what she did to Boruto. In fact, immediately after the omnipotence blasts in chapter either 79 or 80, Ada finds Boruto and tells him that no matter what anybody tries to do to her, she will not reveal his location, which is why Boruto is able to train in peace with Sasuke and Kashin Koji, which shows us immediately after the fact of using omnipotence that Ada felt guilty about it. And this is corroborated by chapter one of Two Blue Vortex, when Ada is talking to Sarada and Sumire and tells them that if they want to try to use omnipotence through her to reverse what she did with Kawaki, that they're welcome to try. Once again, confirming to us that Ada isn't happy about this omnipotence world and that she would do anything to undo it so long as Sarada or Sumire was willing to take the risk. And thus with this as Ada's track record as it pertains to omnipotence, that affects Boruto, I really don't think it's all that likely that Kawaki would be able to use omnipotence again to enact the same thing through Ada. Especially when you consider the fact that if Ada doesn't want to do it again, 
Kawaki's not going to be able to get through Daemon. But obviously, Boruto isn't privy to the majority of this information. I mean, obviously, he knows that Ada came to him after the Omnipotence Blast and told him that she wouldn't track his location, but he doesn't know that Ada's willing to undo the Omnipotence Blast through Sarada or Sumerai. However, if you do believe that Boruto is right in this assumption that Kawaki can use Omnipotence whenever he wants to, then Sarada having an ability that allows her to break people out of the Omnipotence Genjutsu would be incredibly useless. So, as to whether or not we believe Boruto is misguided might be the final indicator of what Sarada's MS abilities might be, which is another moment in this chapter that goes completely under the radar that holds massive importance. Boruto then tells Shikamaru and Ino that he doesn't want to kill Kawaki and that he just wants to slug him and figure this all out. And therefore, because Boruto doesn't want to kill Kawaki, Shikamaru highlights to Boruto that if that's the route he wants to go, that Boruto has to bear the responsibility of remaining a rogue ninja. And because of this, Shikamaru and Konoha have no ability to openly support Boruto. Once again, drawing a clear connection between Boruto and Itachi, even down to their motivations. I mean, think about it. Boruto is now a rogue shinobi who the entire village believes to be a murderer with the sole protection and backing of the Hokage and his most trusted advisor. And the entire village believes Boruto to be a murderer. But Boruto's sole motivation is the saving of his brother who wants to kill him. And honestly, this being Boruto's story makes a lot of sense from a writing standpoint. Who is the most popular character in Naruto? It's Itachi. So if you want to capitalize on the hype and love for Itachi, write a character very similar to him and center the entire story around it. However, if we can identify this trend of a similarity being drawn between Boruto and Itachi, we can possibly become privy to what the end of Boruto's story will be and how the similarities being drawn between Boruto and Itachi will show us how the battle between Kawaki and Boruto will pan out. But as per usual with manga review chapters, that's gonna be another video. That's right, I haven't lost my touch. We then smash cut away from Kawaki and Shikamaru over to Jura and the rest of the Shinju. And Jura is having his Meruem moment. He's reading piles of books and acquiring more knowledge, and he's realizing the more he learns, the less he knows. And thus Jura comes to the realization that if he ever wants an answer to any of his questions, he's gonna have to go and visit Naruto Uzumaki. Which means in chapter 8, we will see the Shinju on the move. This is an interesting idea, because we're not privy to how much information the Shinju have about whether or not Naruto is alive or whether he's in the Daikoku tech. Mind you, Jura wants to meet Naruto Uzumaki, which means that so far as Jura knows, Naruto is still alive. Now, does this mean that Jura is unaffected by omnipotence? Does this mean that Jura knows that Naruto's in the Daikoku Ten? Or does this mean that Jura still thinks that Naruto is the Hokage? Well, regardless of which of these three possibilities is true, Jura and the rest of the Shinju will undoubtedly make their way to Konoha, which is really bad news for literally everybody in Konoha. But what could all of this possibly mean for Konoha in Chapter 8? Well, that's going to be another video, baby. we got more work to do. Because deciphering what Jura and the rest of the Shinju know as it pertains to omnipotence in Naruto's location will give us insight into their approach to Konoha in Chapter 8. But so far as it stands now, who knows? And with that, we've reached the end of Chapter 7. What did you guys think about the chapter? Do you have any theories about what's coming in Chapter 8? Do you believe that Jura knows that Naruto is in the Daikoku Ten? And how did you feel about the battle between Mitsuki and Boruto? Tell me in the comments below. And while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Now I am going to a flamenco show.